A2 Calf 2019, Author Spotlight, Lucy Nisley. My name is Lucy Nisley. I'm a comic artist and author. I've been publishing books for a little over a decade now. I just dropped my pencil. Um, I specialize in autobiographical memoir and travelogue books. Um, my latest one is called Kid Gloves, and it's uh, the story of my own experience becoming a parent, but it's also the story of the history of reproductive health and um, reproductive medicine, the science, the superstitions, and the uh, amazing failure that the medical community uh, shares in this, uh, in this country in serving mothers and children and parents. So um, that cheerful subject and uh, also the story of my own experiences almost dying in childbirth. Uh, I came out with a book in February and it's been wonderful. My other books are about food and about travel and family and uh, my nonagenarian grandparents. Uh, but this book is very important to me, and it's uh, been a wonderful experience publishing it so far. Um, I got into comics pretty young, but I didn't really make the connection that I could do it as a career until I was much older. So this comics reading is really about that feeling of finding, finding a reason to tell stories through pictures. You are five years old. You can read, but writing is harder. For your birthday, you got a set of new markers or crayons or colored pencils, or you stole them from the neglected desk of an older sibling or a parent. Likewise, you got some paper. Maybe it's from a printer, the kind with perforated edges and columns of holes. You've been outside all day maybe in the warm sun, or maybe in the deep, cold snow. Maybe you were swimming until your lips turned blue. Or like me, you were an inside kid watching a movie so good you nearly had or did have an accident because you didn't want to leave to go to the bathroom. Maybe you've arranged your toys into such a deep state of play that you are startled to be called away to the world without. Or you were listening to a parent's gentle cadence, reading a book that you cannot stop living within. In any case, you've seen something, experienced something, and that something is now within. You set your pencil to paper. Maybe your drawing looks right, maybe it doesn't quite, but the feeling is there to set it to paper, to free it from your brain out through your hand. We share this impulse from early childhood maybe from even earlier. What I saw, how it felt, who I am, where I was, how it looked. The self-criticism and frustration will come later. Another kid will tell you your horse looks like a stupid poop with legs, or a teacher will scold you for wasting your time drawing. And that will be where this, following this impulse might taper out. But until then, here it is. Someone will peer over your shoulder, you'll explain what it is on the paper, and it will satisfy something in you that you were able to make this communication happen. If you can recover from the stupid poop horse comment, which I'll argue is a lifelong process, perhaps you will be so taken with this act that you'll become an artist. Perhaps if you like fart sounds and punchlines and never outgrow that basic childhood impulse to combine both words and drawings, you'll be a comic artist or perhaps a reader, both if you're particularly lucky. Lucy, that was so cool. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to be sketching a little bit while we chat. If I can find my drawing thing. There it is. OK. So can you tell us, inspired by that, that reading, a little bit about how your childhood journey to becoming a comics artist happened? Did, did this horse comment happen to you? <laughs> I had a series of bad uh, teachers. <laughs> I had really good teachers, I should say. I had really, really wonderful teachers, including a wonderful art teacher who um, 
was very encouraging. And then she retired, and the person that took her place, um, she was she was bad. She was a bad art teacher. I was a shy kid, and I was the best artist in the class, and that was sort of who I was, unfortunately. And it was something that I really cared deeply about, and I loved to draw. But she was one of those teachers that was like, no, you should pay attention to everyone equally, and everyone is a wonderful artist, and complimenting one person on it is not good, and you should ignore her. And she would like encourage the class to kind of ostracize me. So that was not cool. And then I had this awful fifth grade teacher. Uh, I was a doodler in class. I, I find it difficult to like <clears throat> concentrate in class without moving my pencil. And I would draw, and it, I, it was not something I could help. And this fifth grade teacher was so angry about it that she would wait for the moment my attention wandered from reading aloud in our social studies textbook, which I don't know how anyone is expected to learn that way. Um, but she would wait until that moment. And then she would take me out into the hallway and yell at me. And like there were certain days where she did this six or seven times. And I couldn't stop doing it. And I cried every single time. And the whole class could hear her yelling at me in the hallway. And every time I would come in, I would sit down with my social studies textbook, and I would be like, OK, concentrate on reading along in the social studies textbook. <laughs> and then like five minutes later, I would just start drawing again. This is a dog I saw earlier today wearing a shirt. I saw it on the way here, and it, I have not stopped thinking about it, obviously. <laughs> it's a very good dog. So how did you how did you get from from that fifth grade experience to making your first comics? Um, I so I obviously I was a wonderful student, <laughs> and I didn't uh, I, I would draw constantly in my homework <laughs> instead of doing my homework, and I didn't have good grades because of this. So when it came time to choose a career. Everyone told me, well, you don't have the grades to be a writer. You don't have the grades to go to a, like an intellectual school. But you're a pretty good artist. You could go to art school. So I went to art school. And I was like, I guess I'll be a painter, because that's a reasonable profession. And um, I started studying kind of fine arts, more traditional sort of conceptual fine arts, and, um, and learning about how to make like egg tempera paints and all of these really useful applicable skills. And uh, I learned pretty early on in that process that I really wanted to use my art to tell stories and to make comics. <laughs> but I was in a school that didn't really see comics as a viable artistic genre. So they, uh, they wouldn't let me make them in many cases. And I had to find teachers that were willing to, uh, to let me use comics to fulfill my requirements for the school. And I started making comics and publishing them in the school newspaper, F News Magazine, which was this kind of criminally underread uh, school magazine. And uh, it was this revelation to me because I was this kind of shy kid that didn't, uh, didn't feel connected to my fellow students. And I started making these comics about my experiences in a new city and what I was thinking and feeling. And I sort of filled these papers with all of my emotions. And I published them in the school newspaper. And I started hearing back from all of these other people that had had shared experiences that felt similarly to me. And it was this revelation moment for me where I realized that I could make work that not only made other people feel less alone, but made me feel less alone. That's so cool. Thank you. So how did you go from there to writing these long form autobiographical works? Uh, I started small. Um, a lot of people ask, you know, how did you get started with comics? Because I have this 300 page opus that I have in mind to make. And I'm like, that's wonderful. And you'll get there. But maybe start with like a five page zine <laughs> and see how that goes. Um, so I started out making comics about uh, sort of ripping off picture books when I was a little kid. Um, I had a teacher that taught me how to take a couple pieces of printer paper, folded them in half, and stapling them together along the edges like this. And then uh, I would do that, and then I would fill in the pages with things from books that I liked. So uh, I've always been really afraid of snakes. <laughs> 
I still am. It's like this horrible phobia. I like them in theory, <laughs> but I, I like I have a phobia of them. So there was this book called Amazing Snakes in my classroom in kindergarten. Uh, and I tried to use it as like a cure for my <laughs> snake phobia. How did that work? Uh, I'm still terrified of snakes. <laughs> but I would read this book, and I'd be like, OK, I'm going to like take these snakes into my mind, and it's going to like free me from this fear. I was in kindergarten. This is like my thought process at the time. So I made a whole bunch of books ripping off amazing snakes, where I would try and draw the snakes to try and make myself less afraid of them. So I would make my own version of amazing snakes. And my mom still has one of my amazing snake scenes that I made in kindergarten. And it's, it's just, it's literally, I was just like copying from this. And so those were the short form things that I started out with when I was very young. Um, as I got older, I, uh, I think I started making my own mini comics in college. Uh, one of the great benefits of going to the school that I went to was that Hope Larson was a senior when I was a freshman. And she saw some of my comic work in the school newspaper and reached out to me. And she, uh, if you don't know her work, is wonderful. Hope Larson, she is the author of so many beautiful things, Gray, Ho uh, gray Horses and um, Chiggers more recently, and uh, the uh, summer one, what is it? All summer, summer Long. All Summer Long is so good. Um, she's wonderful. But she, at the time, she hadn't published anything yet. And so she, uh, she was just like, hey, you're a girl making comics. I'm a girl making comics. We should hang out. And she brought me to my first comic convention. Uh, well, she brought me to my first like tabled comic convention and let me sit at her table with her. And that was where I was like, OK, well, I have to have something to sell at the table. So we collaborated on this little book um, that was a collection of letters to people that weren't in our lives anymore. And we'd illustrated these letters together. And it was this wonderful thing for me to work with a professional artist, well, a professional artist. She was like unpublished at the time, but about to get her big break kind of thing. Work with a real comic artist to like learn from her and see how it was done in the comics world. Um, so we published this book together, and that was my first mini comic. And I went from there, and I started making my own ones and taking them to comic conventions. And when I was about to graduate from the uh, School of the Art Institute of Chicago. My mother was turning 50, and she said, look, we're both adults now, and we could use like a way to reconnect. So I'm going to rent a house for six weeks in France. Come with me for your winter break, and we'll just like process these changes in our lives together. So she was about turning 50. I was about to graduate from art school, and I had no idea what I was going to do with my life. And I decided to keep a travelogue of that time. So I'd only ever made mini comics before, and I wanted to challenge myself to like write and draw every day. So I brought a sketchbook with me and a pen. And my mom and I would sit down every night and write and draw about our trip. Um, she would write, and I would write and draw. And I came home with this sort of like very moth-eaten, stained um, sketchbook full of things, but it was not just the story of this trip that I'd taken with my mom. It was really more of a story about a relationship that was changing and a period of time in my life that uh, sort of calcified me as a person. And um, I, I published that. That was my first book. I took it to a comic convention in New York City, and it was picked up by a publisher, and they offered me a publishing contract. So that was my first long-form book, and it was called French Milk. And after that, you you have continued this autobiographical bent. I have, yeah. It's sort of how I got started on making comics, and it's the way I learned how to do this. But it's also the way that I process the world and sort of make order out of chaos. Um, particularly with travelogues, I find that your mind gets so confused and spirals in various ways. and in order to make sense of a lot of things going on in your life, it really helps me to draw them out onto the paper and to have kind of a record of the thoughts and feelings and experiences that I was having at the time. And it, it also allows me to have this kind of time capsule of who I was at a certain period in my life. Um, so as well as autobiography, you, you also do some stuff that's 
like a combination of autobiography and nonfiction essay style work. So how how do you how are those two things different? How how do you think about them differently? Well, if I'm telling the truth about my life, it really makes sense to me to tell the truth in a broader context. And it helps me to understand the world too, particularly with my most recent book, Kid Gloves. Uh, it's the story of my own experience as being pregnant and giving birth, but it doesn't really make sense and it doesn't really have as much meaning unless you understand the broader context of the history and, and the science behind it. So I really wanted to tell my own story about being a giant egg. But I also wanted to tell the story about all the other many, many people that have been giant eggs in the past who uh, helped me get through my own experience. So that was something that just really came naturally in terms of that storytelling. And I try and bring that to a lot of my work, that I want to try and make my own experiences relevant in the larger world and also to compare it to other people who've had different or similar experiences. That's really cool. So since you write autobiography, there's, there's a sense that like there's a lot of your life on the page that's pretty public to people. Um, I personally meet a lot of people who are like, Lucy Nisley, like, yes, I know her, and her son, <laughs> and her cat also. Um, and perhaps many of you feel the same way about Lucy because you are amazing at doing what, what you do. But so how do you, how do you think about your like, on the page, public, commercial, for sale, in books, identity, versus your personal, personal. self. Um, I, <laughs> oh, uh, look, it's a cat. It's Linny. <laughs> um, I started, so my first book, French Milk, came out when I was 21, I believe. So I was pretty young on the publishing scene. And uh, it's, it's a diary. It's a travelogue diary. And in it, I'm like whining, and I'm fighting with my mom, and I'm like, you know, having this existential crisis about art school, and I really feel full of angst and terribleness. There's a lot of good food in it also. There's also a lot of good food in it. And manatees. And manatees. But um, I had this experience where I was like, it's my first published book. I'm going to read all my reviews. <laughs> <laughs> um, which, if you're not aware, you should never read the reviews. Never, ever, ever. Um, and I read the reviews, and everyone who reviewed the book took time out of the review to like review me as a human being and as a person and how I was like this whiny, spoiled, entitled brat, which like I was and am. <laughs> and but like uh, the fact that I was honest and that I portrayed myself in this book uh, shouldn't like it shouldn't really give strangers license to criticize me as a human person. And people that feel alone and feeling these frustrations and feeling whiny and, and you know, self-loathing and, and anxiety ridden deserve to have rep representation as well and to see that they're not alone. And I cringe looking back on that period of time and on that book, but it's so important to me that it exists and that I'm, I'm very happy that I represented myself as I was at that time because I think it's very, uh, not universal, but very, uh, understandable for a person going through these big changes to have those thoughts and emotions and that it's nice to see it represented. I remember one review in particular called me, oh, I think they like reached out to me to be like, I think that you shouldn't have published this book because you're a weak female character. <laughs> it represents a weak female character in comics. And I remember reading that and being like, I have failed women in comics. <laughs> I have I've brought us down the rungs and the ladder. But um, what they failed to grasp is that it was really important to show nuanced female characters that get their periods and fight with their moms and, and are whiny and entitled, and that's fine. And you can still be a worthwhile, decent human being. You can still have a story to tell. You can still have a voice and um, a representation in comics. So um, I try to learn from these things and be better in the future work that I make, but uh, like, I kind of love that 21, 19 year old version of myself. And I'm sad that she didn't know not to read her reviews. <laughs> 
But that's all to say that um, it took me a while and it took me a lot of practice to make the distinction between like the, the person that is me and the person that I represent in my work. Um, I'm very honored and flattered when people are like, I know your cat, I know your son, isn't that weird? And I'm like, no, I put it in a book. I'm really glad that you read it, thank you. <laughs> um, I think it's more awkward for other people to, to feel that kind of one-sided thing, but I'm, I'm always so flattered and so honored. And, um, <clears throat> you know, I just like, I like it when people feel that they know me and feel that they're connected to me. And I also like it when they understand that it's a curated story, that it's not all of me, and um, that I hope that they forgive me for <laughs> some of the ways that I represent myself and in the world. Yeah. So how do you, how do you figure out that curation? Like when you're translating your life to the page or the book, like how do you figure out these are the parts I want to talk about, these are the parts that are personal to me that I'm not going to talk, talk about? How do you figure out, like, this book is going to be tops 300 pages. I cannot fit the entire nine months of my pregnancy plus <laughs> the entire history of women's medicine in here. How, do, how does that work? Um, I always like to say that it's muscle memory, uh, but not everything does make a good story. So I have this, uh, I have this book that I made that is a travelogue of my time in Africa. So I got this wonderful job where I was allowed to go to Africa and write about the food there. And I came back, with, they were like, we want just like a little magazine piece, a couple pages. I was like, great. And I came back with 50 pages of like full color comics. Um, that's just me like losing my mind about elephants because <laughs> they had elephants there. And they were so amazing. And like, how can you not just draw elephants all day long? But it was not what they wanted. And <laughs> they like only used a tiny fraction of it where I actually talk about the food. But uh, that was a real lesson for me in the difference between a good time and a good story and what, what that means in terms of publishing and how to choose the things that I'm going to make into books versus what I'm going to like self-publish or just sort of have as a memento. Uh, so I, I offer the, the Africa travelogue on my website for like a digital download, but I never published it because it's not a good story. It's just like, elephants, yay, um, which was great, but, but maybe not worth making a larger, broader context out of. Um, I do think that travelogging helps make kind of a larger, broader context within your life, but it takes practice to uh, sit down and draw every day and kind of try and find the threads of commonality and pull them together to uh, create broader themes that are going on in your life and to try and find meaning in the travel, meaning in your experiences. But it does take practice. I started out not able to find that and not able to recognize it, but the more that I do travelogues, the easier it gets. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping you can talk a little more about the, the different depictions of women that you were talking about before and kind of unpack that. Like I, I read your books and I find your stories to be really feminist and to be really kind of coming about uh, life and being a worldview in which women are very centered in a kind of activist, kind of revealing gaps in society sort of way and societal, the societal picture of women. Can you, can you talk about that a little more? Sure. Um, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. As a mom and as a comic artist, I find that the, the idea of strong women is so different and so like subject to personal biases. For me, uh, what I want to see represented more are women that are strong in ways that I identify with. Like I'm not a badass with a sword. I like <laughs> I would die in Game of Thrones time, like immediately, I would just be completely dead. And uh, what really appeals to me is to see women represented in media, but particularly in comics, who are thriving without not just super strength and super power, but without things like violence that don't appeal to me. Uh, so the comics that I wanted to make are, are about me for the most part, but I really wanted to showcase things that I find in myself to be my strengths, my ability to uh, be 
organized and to care deeply about something, to be passionate about things, and to be uh, to make good decisions and and to support the people that I love. And that to me is very strong and a very good character representation, but it's not often seen in like much of the media that I consume as well. Uh, I find <laughs> I find myself having uh, no stomach for violence anymore since I became a mother. I didn't have much of one beforehand, but uh, since I became a mom, I like I, I can't watch things like Game of Thrones. I can't watch anything where people get hurt, particularly if a child gets hurt. And I hate that that's so often used as the motivation behind strong characters, the this uh, like acts of violence. And I want to see people that are strong and capable without a terrible, violent, scary, awful backstory. Because I don't, I, I don't think that we necessarily need something terrible in our lives to be a good person <laughs> or to be a strong character. So the work that I make, I try and showcase the strength of people through resiliency and um, through learning and understanding, if that makes sense. <laughs> Well, I think that's great, and I think that's I think that's a very admirable perspective that we all need more in our lives. This is as violent as my work gets right here. <laughs> I'll draw a scary wolf just to make it extra scary. <laughs> um, Look at this scary wolf. I'm going to give it a bow. <laughs> Excellent. That's what every scary wolf needs. I know. This can be your, your personal bowed wolf. I remember somebody tried to insult me once by saying that I could never draw anything scary and that I, I could draw a zombie horror comic and it would be cute. And I was like, thank you. Yes. <laughs> An adorable Lucy Nisley zombie, hair, zombie murder comic. That sounds, that sounds amazing. Thanks. Um, so your most recent book, Kid Gloves, it's all about kids and pregnancy. Can you talk a little more about that? How possibly both about the the events in the book and then your your feeling about kids and pregnancy and kind of how that changed through the process of having a kid? Sure. I always wanted to be a parent, uh, even from when I was very young. And uh, in fact, before I decided to be a comic artist, I thought I would might I might become a midwife. I thought that was very interesting and I read all of my mother's pregnancy books and I studied up and I was very fascinated with it. Um, Murphy Brown became pregnant at a pretty pivotal point in my life. So um, I, was, uh, I was very interested in that whole situation and on what my body was capable of doing, that it was capable of go undergoing this huge change and creating a person. So when I set out to get pregnant, I, I was like, this is going to be so interesting and I really want to write a comic about it. But my pregnancy ended up following a different trajectory than I had expected. I had multiple miscarriages. I had to have a uterine surgery. Um, and then when I did get pregnant, I had a pretty miserable pregnancy where I had uh, hyperemesis, where I was uh, throwing up every day for almost the entire time. And I developed a lot of health complications later on, even though I'm, I'm pretty healthy as a person and uh, almost died in childbirth. And as someone who had good insurance and was very healthy and very informed, it really blindsided me that I was experiencing such a different track than I thought I would take with this. So I wanted to know more and I started looking into it and um, discovering how much our medical system fails people who are trying to become parents and how, uh, how broken it is. <laughs> Uh, we have the highest maternal mortality rate of any developed nation in the world. It is almost six times worse for women of color, which like is horrifying to learn and something I didn't know before I tried to start being, I tried to be a parent. So when my kid was born, uh, you know, becoming a new parent is jarring for anyone. But for me, it was particularly jarring when my enormous baby Kool-Aid manned his way out of me just like zoomed out of my body and uh, and I had a lot to get used to. <laughs> so uh, while I don't recommend, this is a scientific document <laughs> shown in actual fact. Uh, 
Well, we are in a library. The they, they're very big on science here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm teaching you all a biology lesson right now. <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Um, so while I don't recommend spending the year following a traumatic birth, like researching all about the history of traumatic births and um, like the weird superstitions behind it and all of that, it did probably speed up my therapy <laughs> to like really delve into it. Um, and I love parenthood. It was something that I was worried about affecting my art before I became a parent. And my kid has only inspired me and uh, been a great source of humor and fun and given me the, I'm not gonna say courage to do picture books finally. I was always very intimidated to do picture books before I became a parent because they were all so good and wonderful and revered and all of these wonderful picture books. And then I realized that there are actually a lot of really bad ones <laughs> and that I shouldn't feel intimidated because I could definitely do better than like the Tonka Book of Drills that my kid really likes right now. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, it's been a wonderful uh, benefit to me as an artist, I think, yeah. to become a parent, both because it was something I was fascinated with the science and the history and the biology of, um, and personally in understanding my own trauma and uh, my own transition to parenthood. And then now that he's a person in the world that I can like draw cute pictures of him all the time. He's very yeah. cute. Yes. And you just did your first picture book as well. I did, yeah. It's called You Are New and it's about babies and how they're great. <laughs> Do you want to tell us anything more about that, that process? Um, it's funny because as I said, I was very intimidated by picture books. So it took me uh, the same amount of time to write that book as it does to write one of my 300 page graphic novels. And it's like 32 pages long. And it's, yeah, it's like 32 pages long. Uh, the art came much faster. Uh, the art was very quick, but I was very interested in the writing of it and trying to create a good cadence because there's so many children's books that I was reading to my kid that like, you, you get broken out of the cadence and it, it breaks up the rhythm of bedtime. So I, wanted, I was like very interested in writing a book that was easy to read at bedtime. Oh, that's great. Um, so as well as kids, I know you have a lot of feelings about cats as well. I do. Can you, can you talk to us about some of them? I can. <laughs> I have a 13, almost 14 year old cat <laughs> named Linny who is, uh... <laughs> so when I had my kid, I became of course obsessed with him. I still am. But uh, all of my comics for like the year following his birth were all just like, baby, look at my baby. <laughs> Which I recommend, it was great. It was really fun. Uh, and I really enjoyed that time. But now he's like a person who can have a conversation with me. So I am trying to like swing my attention a little bit away from him so that he's not always in the spotlight of my comics. So if I have to put that energy somewhere, I have to like swing my energy away from him onto my poor cat. And she just spent the last, uh, you know, she, after my kid was born, she spent a year kind of being ignored. And she's this elderly cat, and if you don't know about elderly cats, as they age, they get more vocal. So she just complains constantly. She's just constantly got, got things to say to me. Um, and she, she was just there when I was like, okay, I need to take some attention off of my kid and the comics that I make in my like spare time, I'm going to start, uh, focusing elsewhere. And then she'd be like, Meh! right here. So, <laughs> so I was like, all right, you have things to say. I'm going to start, um, translating you, I think. So I would start taking her yaps and turning it into what she was meaning to say. So these became the series of comics that I've been making about my cat, Linny. Uh, she has the voice and intonation and complaints of like an elderly British lady from the 1940s. <laughs> uh, and she's very angry most of the time because she's hungry, but she won't eat the food that I give her because she's very picky. And uh, she also lives with a toddler, so she's got to deal with that all the time. And she lives with people that work, and so she, uh, she has a lot of complaints.
Oh. <laughs> yeah, you've had her for a while, though. I did. We adopted her when she was four. Whoops. You've been making comics of her for some time. I have. I've been making comics since we got her, um, like 10 years ago. Uh, but they started out as just like, here is my cat. And now she's really developed her own voice in my comics. I, I feel like uh, if and when I ever make a published book about the Linny stuff, I'm going to have to share writing credit with her. Uh -huh. That sounds great. Um, so when you are working on these published books, um, this, this art is fantastic to watch. Oh, good. I'm, I'm I'm, I hope you all are enjoying it, too, because I really am. Uh, but this presumably is not kind of like, I would like to make a graphic novel, and then you like sit on a stage in front of an audience of people, and then are like, okay, in the first panel of Relish, like I'm drawing it right now. Like, what what is that process that that happens when you're going to do a book as opposed to live drawing in front of a crowd? Um, it's very different. I do the kind of traditional scripting thing, which is a little bit like. Uh, screenwriting for a movie, uh, which I don't really like that comparison because it, it sort of makes comics sound like a movie ripoff. And these days there's this big stigma where if you're a comic artist, people assume that you're just making comics so that you can get it made into a movie. And that's not the case. Uh, I, as somebody who dreads the thought of one of my books being made into a movie, I, uh, I, I don't envision them as a movie when I'm working on them. But it is similar to writing a screenplay, I am told, uh, particularly if it is fiction, which uh, the book that I just completed the pencils on is fiction. And that was the most like writing a screenplay of any of my books so far. The others are more like writing an essay, um, where it's, it's an essay format when it's written. And then I have to break up the essay format into um, panels, into like various ideas that can be represented in a panel. But uh, but the book that I just finished for Gina's company is uh, called Stepping Stones. I just finished the pencils on it. So there's a process. Um, so I start with like layout, and then uh, that turns into script, which turns into uh, something that I've been calling a maquette, which is not the word for it. But it's a term that I learned in animation class when I was learning how to be an animator. And that's just the text and the panels. So I fill in the text like this and the panels of the page, and I have a vague idea of what's going to go in the panels, but there's no picture yet. Um, and then I do the pencils, which, uh, which is filling in the pictures in the maquette that I had before. Uh, and then I ink it, and then I color it. And then it's a book. And then it's a book. Okay. <laughs> and then I give it to somebody else, and they make it a book. <laughs> yes. Um, do you want to talk a little about Stepping Stones and what that's going to be yeah, about? Yeah, totally. Um, so Stepping Stones is my first middle grade book. It's uh, based, I thought, if I'm going to get into fiction, I have to do like baby steps. So it's based on my own life. Uh, and it's pretty obvious about it. Um, the characters are Jen and Andy. Uh, and I'll draw a picture of Jen for you. Um, see if you can tell who she's based on. Um, so Jen is a city kid whose mom moves her after their parents divorce up to the country onto a farm. And she's got to like learn how to take care of chickens and farm and work at the farmer's market and things like that, which is what happened to me as a child. Um, but not only that, her mom gets a new boyfriend, and uh, the boyfriend has two daughters, uh, Andy and Reese. Andy is uh, Jen's age, and she is very different from Jen. Jen is into comic books and sort of being inside and not really... Uh, she's sort of shy and awkward, and she's got a learning disability when it comes to math, which I had as well, have, continue to have. Um, but... Andy, on the other hand, is very good at school, and she's very smart, and she knows everything. She's kind of bossy, and she's a know-it-all. Um, but they sort of have to learn how to get along, because they're stepsisters now, uh, essentially. And they both work at the farmer's market with uh, Jen's mom and uh, little 
Reese, who is only like six. Um, so this is based on my experiences with my stepsisters, uh, who I'm still close to. And it's really about finding your place in a new situation, both familially and uh, locationally. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask you one more question and then I'm going to open up the questions to the audience so that they can ask you all about your work and all about your, your life and your cat if they wish to know about your cat. Um, so begin thinking of questions now if you have them. Okay, so the last question I wanna just ask is, what are you reading? Is there stuff that you would recommend to everyone? Yeah, um, I just finished a preview copy of Jen Wang's new book, Stargazing, which is so, so good. good. It's so good. She's amazing. Um, she's amazing. I think that uh, The Prince and the Dressmaker was like the best book that came out that year, and it was just a, an unbelievable piece of work. And now she's just hitting it out of the park again with this next one. So I've been really amazed by it. Um, I just got back from London. Uh, my dad turned 70 and he wanted to take a trip to London and uh, I did not keep a travelogue of that because I was traveling with my three-year-old at the time and three-year-olds do not lend themselves well to travelogues as it turns out. <laughs> so, uh, but it was a wonderful trip and I was able to go see the Posey Simmons show at the House of Illustration um, and it was so wonderful and I brought back a bunch of Posey Simmons work. So I just also read a collection of her literary comics that she did for um, a newspaper in London and they're all so interesting because they're so applicable to the sort of the literary world of today, even though oh, she fantastic. did them in like the 1960s. Super That's cool. Great. Yeah. She's amazing. Who... Posey Simmons is so good. I, I've also now been starting to buy all of her children's books for my kid. Um, and they're all delightfully British. I love them. Oh, That's great. Baker Cat is my most favorite so far. And it's just about a cat who's a baker. <laughs> That sounds amazing. It sounds right up my alley. Right? It has everything. <laughs> okay. I've only ever gotten really in trouble once with my comics and making comics about my family, and it was my grandmother, um, who has since passed, and so now I can tell the story. But she, uh, <laughs> we went out to dinner, and we were sitting around a table, and she said a horrible thing. And I was like, shocked by this horrible thing from this person that I love. And I came home and I, like, the way that I process the world is by making comics about it. So I made comics about it. And it was just sort of about the weirdness of going to visit my grandmother, who, who I love very much. But like, she, she lived in Florida. She was a big supporter of the Bush family. And so she, in order to try and convert her like liberal children to her ways, would hide pictures of the Bush family, like the entire Bush family, like family photographs, in weird places. Like if you opened a cabinet to get a mug, there'd be a picture like in the cabinet and stuff. And she, she's a, like a strange lady. And so it was like that and this horrible thing that she said at dinner. And, um, and I just had this like weird little comic and, I published it, I self-published it in a book called Radiator Days that's like a collection of my student work and it's really like, it's all kinds of weird inappropriate things. I was experimenting with styles and like doing assignments and so, so it's just like this collection of totally wacky stuff and it's since, I've taken it out of print since. And it was hard to get this comic. You, could, you had to really go out of your way to do it. And one of my grandmother's busybody neighbors went through every hoop, jumped through every hoop to get this book. And they got it and they read it and they were like, Gloria, you need to read this book that your granddaughter did and gave it to her. And my grandmother read it and she didn't care about any of the like sex, drugs and rock and roll of this book. The only comic that she cared about was this one comic where I was like, I'm visiting my grandmother and it's Kooky Dukes. And <laughs> she was so hurt by it and she called my mother, like, you know, why does Lucy hate me, and et cetera, et cetera. And so I called her and I was like, I'm really sorry. I'm, I really didn't mean to hurt you. Um, I, I'm very sorry for that. But <laughs> I will say that if you're going to say something the way that you did at that dinner that is racist, it was racist and awful, um, you should be accountable that there are people around you listening, and particularly people like me who sort of process the world in the way that I do, and I, I really think that you should reconsider saying the things that you're saying, and um, 
particularly around me, I don't like it. Obviously, I don't like it. I'm, <laughs> I won't make any more comics about you, but I, I just want you to know that, like, you did say that thing. So, fair enough. So, uh, it was fine. She never said anything like that in front of me again, which was great. A huge added benefit to this whole ordeal. I was definitely out of the will. Um, <laughs> she, uh, every time I would come out with a new book, she'd be like, oh, God, another one. Um, so she was, like, not super into the career after that. But um, that's the only time I ever really got in trouble. I'm very careful to run things past uh, the people in my life, my parents and my partner, uh, before I publish them now, uh, if they're ever included in my work. And uh, my partner knows what he married. Like, <laughs> he knows what he was getting into, and, uh, you know, I, he knows that I'm, I'm very careful uh, about the things that I curate in my work. What did your stepsisters think about Stepping Stones? So, <laughs> so Stepping Stones is fiction, <laughs> and all the names have been changed. But I did just see my uh, my stepsister lives in Australia, but she's living in Brussels right now with her family. And so she came in when I was in London, and we got together, and I saw her. And I I had brought the finished uh, pencils for Stepping Stones, and I was like, I really want to show this to you. I want you to read it, and like, I want you to uh, know that this is this the story that I'm telling. Um, it's fictionalized, <laughs> like I, you know, I gave her the whole spiel, and she was like, okay. But my stepsister is an engineer, and she has a very different mind than mine, and she does not remember like anything from our childhood. <laughs> so she was like, this would be entirely your story, because I don't know, I, I don't remember anything from it. Um, but like, she read it, and it was so interesting, because she was like, oh yeah, I really did like to rub it in that I knew math and you didn't. <laughs> and I was like, yeah! And um, so she, she's not like a storyteller. She doesn't have these stories like, you know, festering away inside her. So she doesn't, she doesn't really get what I do. But she read the book, and she thought it was really cute. And um, one of the things in the book is the stepfather, like yeah. the, my stepfather, uh, who was a really obnoxious man. <laughs> he was a very obnoxious man. But uh, I grew to love him after I was like not having to live in the house with him anymore. And uh, he passed away a few years ago. And so I, it was really interesting to write him, to write the character based on him for this book, because I had to make him obnoxious. But also, I, like, I remember him fondly now in this obnoxious way. And I'm like, oh, he was such a blowhard. I miss him. <laughs> um, so I had to write him in this kind of sensitive way, but also make it clear how obnoxious he was. And I remember when I sent it to you, and you were like, this character is awful. He's terrible. And I was like, I know, and he was, but I miss him. <laughs> and it was so weird to have to kind of show th the good side of this character, even though I was, like, as a child, I was so frustrated with having to live with this obnoxious person. And um, showing it to my stepsister, who lost her father a number of years ago, and she was like reading him and just being like, oh man, you really got it right. You got it right. He was this obnoxious. I miss him so much. And it's so funny because I have to, I, I somehow have to make him this beloved oaf in this story. It's been a challenge for my writing. Wow. I, I appreciate you tackling that. Thank adding, you. adding some good parts of him. Yes. Into the, yeah. Into he, the he was narrative. very nice to my mom. <laughs> that, that's a big positive. That's a huge positive. It was very important. Um, so you have a kid. I do. Who seems very small and time consuming. <laughs> how, how do you balance that with also drawing sometimes like more than 200 pages a year? <laughs> um, well, as you may have noticed from my live drawing, I'm pretty fast. Um, but I also have childcare. And it's one of those things in, in like, you don't think about in the parenting community because you want, well, everybody sort of wants everybody to say, like, it's so easy, you can have it all. Um, but I think it's really important to talk about childcare uh, in the art artistic community and otherwise, uh, because I remember when I was pregnant, I was like, maybe I should give up my job when my kid comes and just be a full-time parent, which would be fine and, and wonderful, but my job is very important to me and meaningful to me, and I find a great deal of meaning in it. Um, but maybe the money that I make wouldn't be equal to, te to paying for childcare, and maybe that means that it's not worthwhile. And I remember having those thoughts, and I think about that now, and I want to like shake past me and be like, stop thinking in terms of money. Um, I have a wonderful nanny that came in when my child was 12 weeks old, 
I was very lucky to be able to afford to have her and very lucky that I got the nanny that I did. She's also an artist, so I feel that I am supporting the arts by hiring her and she is supporting the arts by uh, helping me. And um, it's just been a wonderful experience. She started out part time. Now my kid uh, just this week is starting to go to preschool five days a week and um, I pick him up at three every day and we have a little time in the afternoons, but uh, sh for a while it was like the nanny for a couple days a week, and then I had him the rest of the time, and then she like was three days a week, and then she was four days a week, and, um, and then he started preschool at like three days a week again. So uh, I'm very lucky that I have the job that I do where I can like take a day off if he gets sick, or if I wanna yank him out of school and take him to the museum or something, it's like fine, I can do that. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful situation that I find myself in as a parent, but childcare has been so essential, not only in my work, but in my fulfillment in my work, because I feel like it's, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like it's, it's not me supporting my nanny. It's me supporting myself and my family and the money that I spend on childcare, uh, helps to enrich all of our lives, um, in creating independence for my son, independence for me and, um, it, like fulfillment in my work and it's wonderful I highly recommend it some comic artists that I know very well are having babies now um, Kate Beaton just had a wonderful beautiful baby and I love it so much um, and she reached out to me and she was like when did you go back to work like what do you do about childcare what about the fact that comics don't make enough money to really justify childcare and I was like they do and <laughs> it's not just your child it's your partner's child as well and like you both need to have some help. You need some help wherever you can get it, whether it's family members or childcare professionals. Uh, it's really important. And um, I also don't want Kate Beaton to stop making comics. I love them. And so I'm like, yeah. please, please have some help so that you can continue to make your amazing work. And Hope Larson is about to have her kid too. And she's, um, I, she, she's so good. And I want her to continue to make her work. So uh, it's one of these things that uh, can't be measured in money. Okay, well, on that note, we're gonna wrap up. Thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, everyone. This program was recorded on June 15th, 2019 at the Ann Arbor District Library.